Hi, everybody. Good, good evening. We're going to uh, get started, so if you could take some seats. Welcome to Hartford Public Library. Uh, my name is Jeffrey Mainville. I'm a programming and events manager here. Tonight's event is the first of a two-part series that recognizes the history and achievements of the Hartford Fire Department. I would like to take this opportunity to welcome all active and retired fire department personnel that are joining us this evening from Hartford or otherwise, other towns, and also to acknowledge uh, widows, siblings, children of persons that were affected by this tragedy. Thank you all for being here this evening. I'd also like to remind you that next Tuesday night, uh, the second part of this series, on July 21st, uh, we'll be joined by retired chief John B. Stewart, Jr., who will discuss his book, A Hard Climb Up the Ladder, uh, the story of the first black fire chief of a major New England city. Chief Stewart joined the Hartford Fire Department in 1952 and served for 40 years. The program will be a conversational format and Hartford current columnist and Fox 61 television host Stan Simpson will be here to lead the discussion with the chief. Please join us next Tuesday at 6 p.m. right here in this room. Tonight's program is one of many offered by the library's Hartford History Center. Here on the third floor of this building, a special collections archive that houses nearly 400 years of Hartford-specific artifacts and records. Hartford Public Library is redefining the role of the urban library in the 21st century as an innovative and edu educational place to explore and learn, offering a rich array of cultural and academic resources. We invite you to join us on this exciting journey. At this time, I'd like to uh, introduce uh, from the Hartford Fire Department, Deputy Chief Dan Nolan. Good evening, ladies and gentlemen. Uh, I'm not in uniform for the Hartford Fire Department because I'm in a lot of trouble with them as I usually am, but uh, not much different than my father. And uh, my father was mentioned in this book and uh, I got to, to meet uh, Mark just recently, but spoke to him on the phone in some uh, lengthy conversation. And it was quite interesting to you know, hear each other's perspectives of what uh, took place that day and uh, the events that changed uh, history in the fire department and also uh, hospitals uh, from that day. And one thing I found interesting that Mark had told me was that um, with the information he received after the book, he could probably write two more books uh, from uh, meeting with people who were there and uh, finding out you know, different truths and different facts. And I, I like the fact that it's a, a, it's a fiction, nonfiction book. You know, the, uh, the fiction part is the romantic part with the uh, police officer because that wouldn't happen in reality knowing that firefighters are smarter, better looking, and more humble <laughs> than police officers. So naturally, it would have been a firefighter hooking up with a nurse, not a cop, in my, <laughs> my opinion. But, um, it was, um, but the, um, the nonfiction part uh, uh, related to the, the bravery and the courage of uh, not only the firefighters, but you know, tremendous uh, uh, courage from the hospital staff that you know, I wasn't really thinking about uh, growing up hearing the stories of that fire. Because it was like, um, at that time, probably the 9-11 uh, to my my family and probably to the fire department uh, of its time. And um, my father had always spoke about uh, one guy, Dick Tajarian, who was actually the book is named after, out of reach, you know, jumping from the top of the ladder. And um, <clears throat> my father was never a guy to uh, write up people for awards. And uh, he tried to, to get one for Dick, but they turned him down. And uh, I like the fact that this book gives Dick that uh, honor. You know, I think it's a medal of honor, this book. So it makes me proud to, uh, he, he got that gratification, even though he's not with us anymore, that his memory will live on uh, for that courageous moment that he, uh, that probably saved many more lives without him. So, and uh, my father was proud to be his officer, and I'm sure anyone 
in this room that ever worked with him was proud to work with him. And I'd like to acknowledge uh, the people who were here or there that day, the firefighters that were working in the fire department, police officers, and any hospital staff. Could you please stand for a quick round of applause? Or you can sit. I know some. Uh... <laughs> Uh, I'm also going to introduce uh, some people probably already know him very well. Uh, Mike Gary, he the fire marshal of the uh, Hartford Hospital, whose you know family's been in, who's currently in the Hartford Fire Department and's been in the fire department for many years, and they have a great history of uh, protecting people. So it's my proud honor to introduce a good friend of mine, Mike Gary. He. Thank you, Dan. Wow, two tough acts to follow right there. Um, but I need to thank all of you for giving me the honor of uh, doing the introductions tonight. And uh, I see quite a, famili a few familiar faces in the audience. And we also have quite a few, um, well, I'm gonna call them icons of the fire service here tonight. But for those who I haven't met, uh, my name is Mike Garrahy, and for the past 29 years, like Dan said, I've been uh, working for Hartford Hospital as the hospital uh, fire marshal. And uh, just give you a little background here. Many moons ago, um, while this book was still an idea, I received a call from Dan asking me to speak with Mark Renata. Anybody who knows Dan can understand why I was a little bit apprehensive and skeptical. Usually when I answer the phone, when he calls, it costs me $100 to some charity. But I answered the call. I was a little apprehensive, though. I, I didn't know Mark, never met him before, and didn't know what he was going to do to the story of the hospital fire. And it was then and still is now important to me to get this story correct. Um, the story of the hospital fire and its impact on health care is truly one of health care's Phoenix moments. And, and all you hospital employees that, st that stood up, that were there that day, I applaud you because you were facing terror that day. And you're here to talk about it today. Um, the code enforcement guys who are here, you can back me when I, when I say that uh, the Hartford Hospital fire is significant because it changed the way the fire service looks at health care and the way we protect patients nowadays. I'm happy to report that Mark did a great job in terms of accuracy when telling the story of the fire and then uh, masterfully added his own twist to the tragic events of December 8th, 1961. At all times, Mark was extremely respectful to the tragic nature of the event. He did a considerable research, and I can attest to that because I burned a lot of shoe leather walking him around the hospital. A uh, little bit about Mark, and I'm not going to go too deep into this. Uh, he's blushing already. He grew up in the south end of Hartford, graduated from Providence College, and uh, worked several years as a journalist before uh, joining UTC. He spent the next 25 years of his uh, professional life in public relations and communications, ultimately as vice president for UTC and later the corporation's Otis Elevator Division. He also served as the executive assistant to the UTC chairman and CEO. He did a lot of traveling in his uh, business relationships, particularly in Eastern Europe, China, and Southeast Asia and he was one of the first businessmen through the Brandenburg Gate in, when the Berlin Wall came down in 1989. He also participated in the first American joint, event, uh, joint venture established in Vietnam after the normalization of relations. Today he's retired and he tells me uh, he's living the dream. My comments tonight don't come lightly about Mark. Uh, I've spent a lot of time with Mark. I've read his work and I really consider him to be one of the great what-if authors. 
He writes from his home in Wethersfield by the golf course with the help of his grandson and German shepherd, right? All right. When I started, I said there were fire service icons in the room. I congratulate all the fire service personnel here tonight, past, present, and I see a candidate shirt out there, so I'm gonna toss in the word future. Um, regardless of title, in the fire service, we have the best occupation in the world. The day you raise your right hand, it's like hitting the lottery. It's a great career in a fairly thankless environment. But tonight, we also have a group of uh, firefighters who work the Hartford Hospital fire. And I see another one of them walking in fashionably late, Mr. Droney. He's not even listening to me as usual. All right, I'm gonna do it again. Mr. Skian, Mr. King, Frank, you guys stand up and be recognized, please. And have, have I missed any other firefighters from 1961? George, George, you gotta stand up too. Will you stand up please? George also was with the fire department in the communications division. I met this gentleman about 15 minutes ago. He asked me my name, I told him, he looked at me right in the eye and said, I worked for your grandfather. <laughs> Long time ago, right? All right, all right, I, I'm almost done. And I got a lot of pages here, but as you can see, I'm getting old, so the writing's real big. Um, Guys, everybody needs heroes when they're young. And, and my friends all had theirs, their sports heroes, their superheroes, whatever it might have been. But I'm a firehouse brat. My heroes were in the firehouse. I had my pop, my dad, my uncle, Mr. Droney, and a slew of others. Um, these were the guys who were doing the job when fires were a lot more prevalent than they are today. The guys who were doing the job when, when their bunker gear was a long rubber raincoat and pull-up boots. Uh, these were the guys doing the job when fire apparatus had only open air cabs. And, and to think about that, think about last February, driving around in negative 12 in an open air cab. These guys are the real heroes. And I'm proud to say that I'll never be able to fill their shoes, but I followed in their footsteps. And that's it for me. Thank you and enjoy your evening with Mark. You're on, kid. Good evening. To my great surprise and honor, the chief of the Hartford Fire Department just walked in. Chief Huertes, thank you very much for coming. <laughs> Good evening and, and thank you very much for visiting with me tonight in the, the splendid Hartford Public Library. And I grew up hiding in, in, the, in the little Canfield Avenue branch in Berry Square. I used to hide in the stacks. I loved the smell of books, still do. But this, this building, if you explore this, this gem of a building, you're gonna find that it's really a remarkable asset for a small city like ours. Every bit as impressive as the Wadsworth, the Bushnell, the Hartford Stage, the Children's Science Center, the Mark Twain House. I know I didn't forget them, I'm just leaving my options open on the Hartford Yard Goats, but maybe they'll surprise us too. <laughs> I also want to say a very special thank you to my friend Jeff Mainville, um, Programming Director, for his kind invitation. Jeff, you've been an absolute delight to work with, I really mean that. And I think your presence here at the library means great things for this organization. Thank you. And of course, many thanks to Deputy Chief Dan Nolan, I won the bet, only took you 10 seconds to get in trouble. And Hartford Fos uh, Hospital Fire Marshal Mike Gerhe for his endless support. A little more about Mike later. Also, a special welcome to former Chief John Stewart. I think, John, are you here? I know you're gonna be here. It's an honor to have you here tonight, John. You know, as I thought about talking with you tonight and what I was gonna say, I thought a lot about it. A few things occurred to me. One is that I'm a very lucky man for a number of reasons. My, my wife is sitting in the back of the room. That makes me a very lucky man. I've been married to her for 38 years. My son drove up from Boston, would you believe, this afternoon to see this, to my surprise. 
And my younger son is next to him, and he runs the business portion of this. He's the guy that sells the books. I'm a very lucky guy. But you see, after running on the corporate treadmill for what seemed like a lifetime, now as an author, as a storyteller, I finally come to understand what Joseph Campbell, the noted American mythologist, meant when he wrote these words. The privilege of a lifetime is being who you are. I've had many opportunities in my life, but none so satisfying as being a storyteller. Literally given the privilege to touch people with my words and ideas, to perhaps enlighten them, to possibly change the way in which they think about something, to make them feel, maybe to laugh or even cry. There are times I shake my head and wonder that I've been given this second chance at fulfilling my life. It also occurred to me that although it was Jeff who called with the invitation, it was actually fate that brought me here tonight. Yes, fate and fire. You see, from my earliest childhood, fire has influenced my life. Do you see that beautiful, elegant lady right there, my wife? Well, thank you, Lord. She is my wife, and I'm very proud of her. But you, know, you want to know how I met her? I met her at a fire. I met her when I was just about this big. I was three years old. We were standing in a crowd on the Silestine Highway in Wethersfield on May 20th, 1955, a Friday night, in a parking lot of her father's gas station, Hughes Brothers, right on the Hartford Line. Some of you might remember Hughes Brothers. What we were watching, at least in the eyes of three-year-olds, was the most terrifying, most unimaginable disaster unfolding just a few hundred yards from where we stood. I desperately holding on to my father's hand. She's searching for her father, who, as a fireman, was somewhere in the middle of the hell on earth that was mesmerizing us. It was the Wethersfield Lumberyard Fire of 1955, the biggest fire to this day in the history of that town. The scene was best described by reporter Ralph Menard of the Hartford Times the next day when he wrote, fire burned the heart out of New England's biggest lumberyard last night, devouring several acres of stacked lumber. Devouring. Amazing word when you think of fire and, and connected with the word devouring. That was the first fire I had ever seen. And it's still burning up here in my mind's eye. But there was something else about that moment, something much more profound, something much more, it hit me so hard that it influenced the writing of Out of Reach. The Westfield Volunteer Fire Department, as you may know, is the oldest chartered volunteer fire department in the country, still. At that time, it was only 50 men strong. So it was a Friday night, and maybe 30 were available to, to handle blades that threatened to engulf a lot more real estate than just the, the, the lumber yard, but also the stately mansions that are all along the cove. And of course, my father-in-law's gas station. He had a vested interest. Those Westfield firefighters fought that blaze all night and into the next day. At one point, the wind shifted, and they almost lost the pumper to the fire. I mean, it was really a barn burner. But a headline from this tattered old copy of the Hartford Times tells you why the fire monster, shooting flames 60 feet into the air, was finally defeated that night. It says it right in the subhead. Six towns help battle Inferno. That's right. Hartford firefighters came running when Wethersfield needed help. And close under their heels were firefighters from Rocky Hill, Newington, Cromwell, Bloomfield, South Windsor, the Westfield section of Middletown, and even Pequannock. The Pequannock Fire Department brought down a 3,300-gallon water tanker from Windsor. So not only did I meet my future wife that night and see the virtual birth of mutual aid in the greater Hartford area, but I also witnessed, for the first time as a small child, the brotherhood of firefighters in action. I remember thinking it was like a family. When one of the brothers was in trouble, everyone showed up to help out without being asked. The only difference was this family was dressed in black rubber coats and leather helmets, and they cursed like the Dickens. But 22 years later, my late father-in-law, Captain Richard Speck Hughes, allowed me to take his daughter's hand. I had enormous respect for the guy, not just because he let me marry his daughter, not just because he was a good man, but also because he was a fireman and in his own quiet way, a hero. As a member of a volunteer fire department, he'd work all day and then run out of the house at some ungodly hour of the morning, usually in freezing cold weather, 
work a fire for three or four hours, and then report to his job running a gas station right on time that same morning. I don't think I ever once heard him complain about being tired or unappreciated. He did it because he loved it and because he was a good man who truly did care for the welfare of others. Not just people he knew, not just neighbors and families, but complete strangers. He would risk his life without hesitation for people he had never seen before and probably never would again. Just like every firefighter who has ever climbed an area ladder, lugged the hose, wrestled a nozzle, or ripped out a burning ceiling in searing, killing flames and heat and suffocating smoke. So the last thing that occurred to me was that we don't nearly appreciate how much people like my father-in-law, like Dan Nolan and Mike Garrahee and every other firefighter in this room and all over the world contribute to our communities. These men and women have dedicated their lives to a profoundly noble cause, the safety and welfare of others who depend on firefighters to be at their absolute best when they're facing their absolute worst nightmare. Now, it really is an honor to be here about the subject of my newest book, Out of Reach, The Day Harford Hospital Burned. But it's more than that. It's humbling. Because frankly, it puts me in the company of genuine heroes, some of whom are with us tonight. And it provides me the opportunity to tell you about one of the greatest moments in the history of the Harford Fire Department, an event that firefighters everywhere should remember with a kind of reverence. You see, this is a story about simple but great men who faced impossible odds and would not accept defeat. On a smaller scale, what happened at the corner of Seymour and Jefferson Streets 53 years ago was the equivalent of D-Day in the small city of Hartford, Connecticut. For those of you who read any of my novels, you know that I'm addicted to historical fiction and a very simple question. What if? Follow me, if you will, just for a moment as we look at some of the greatest what if questions in history, or at least some of those that have intrigued me all my life. For example, for example, what if Titanic's crew had seen that infamous iceberg just a moment sooner? Well, it's safe to say the outcome might have been very different for the 1,513 people who perished that early April morning in 1912. Or what if on that tragic day in September 1938, the US Weather Service had not lost track of a massive Category 3 hurricane bearing down on the entire Northeast coastline from Long Island to Maine? What if people in its path had known there was a monstrous 60-foot tidal wave coming directly at them? The answer is similar. Most, if perhaps not all, of the 600-plus victims of the great New England hurricane might have survived. And what if men with more brains than testosterone had seen the folly of Vietnam? Might 50,000 boys have lived and countless more been saved from horrific physical and psychological trauma? And what if two Air Florida pilots on a stormy day in January 1982 noticed that there was too much snow on the wings of their 737 as they took off from Washington National Airport towards the E Street Bridge in the ice-covered Potomac River? 78 people would have continued on with their lives. What if, what if? In each of these examples, history could have been rewritten, but for a turn but for a thought, but for a look, many would have lived to see another day. And could it be? Some of the survivors might even have influenced history in their own way, perhaps even to be remembered for their singular contribution to mankind rather than as victims of a tragedy. My final example. What if, on a Friday afternoon in early December 1961, 70 men 70 Hartford firefighters who suddenly found themselves thrust into harm's way against impossible odds failed in their efforts to stop a fire monster, a hideous, merciless beast determined to devour, there's that word again, the city's symbol of pride, its hospital, and the 5,000 people who were in it. What if they had backed down in fear? What if they had said, it can't be stopped? What if Chief Thomas Lee had said, save the basement? Which is the perfect segue for me to share with you the prologue from Out of Reach. Perhaps if the fairy tip stub of a cigarette hadn't been flicked into the center of the trash chute, where tons of flammable refuse was piled high a half dozen floors below, 
It might have slid down one of the smooth metal walls of a ductwork and miraculously fallen, harmlessly, into the bottom of a waiting garbage bin and simply burned itself out. Or what if it had fallen deeply in unimpeded black hole and landed on a scrap of non-combustible rubbish? Might the bit of burning tobacco have gone cold from lack of fuel? What if the strong gusts of air naturally funneling up the long trash chute had caught the tiny remnants of the cigarette with its few grams of weight and held it in midair, causing it to dance on currents of wind until its deadly crimson ember had cooled? Or if the maintenance workers in the basement below had caught the first scent or seen whiffs of smoke coming from the chute just a few minutes earlier, might they have used their long hook poles to drag the minuscule remains of burning tobacco from its lethal perch? What if? What if? And perchance, those who had come to this refuge of care, the sick seeking to be healed, the healers determined to cure, loved ones hoping to provide comfort, might have lived. The innocents would not have suffocated or burned to death in their hospital beds. A young doctor, his brilliant future ahead, might not have suffered a hideous death trying to save his patients. Nurses would not have been incinerated at their posts or immolated as they fled the inferno. Visitors would not have died gruesomely, clawing at doors and windows for air, for escape, for freedom, and mercy from the fire monster. The fire monster, a terrifying villain if there ever was one, the personification of absolute evil. Who would have blamed anyone, even a firefighter, a trained firefighter, from backing down from this beast? But if they had, the history of our capital city would be far different today. Hartford wouldn't be known for the Charter Oak, Mark Twain, the home of a once great hockey team, or even the scene of a deadly circus fire. It would today be remembered as the site of the greatest metropolitan disaster in American history, perhaps with a greater loss of life than that even which we suffered on 9-11. But those 70 men didn't back down. They didn't quit. Defeat was not an option. They changed the outcome of what appeared to be very terrible history in the making. And that is a summary of the story of the Hartford Fire Department on that fateful day. And I've covered a lot of stories and, and written about many subjects in my career as a journalist, a communications executive, and, and novelist. And as a reporter, I did some pretty silly things. I, I wasn't particularly brave, just too stupid to run away from danger because I was always looking for that one memorable photograph, that one special byline. But since I wasn't able to witness some of those seminal events of the 20th century that I just spoke of, I've authored novels on them. The Titanic, the 1938 hurricane, Vietnam, Air Florida, Flight 90. All of these were tragic events that shook the world, and in some cases, they shaped the world. And each of them captivated me, turned me into a junkie for the story. I craved not only was written, it was written just below the headline, but I also was hungry to know the intimate details, the facts that sometimes never make the news. And that ultimately is what drew me to write Out of Reach the day Hartford Hospital burned. Because it chronicles a tragedy that on the surface is not on a par with some much bigger stories of the 20th century, but lying deep within its bones is the story never told before, the one that made grown men weep and that haunted them to the day they died. I must admit, it also represents a seminal event in my own life. On December 8, 1961, I was a nine-year-old boy enjoying a day off from parochial school because it was a holy day of obligation. It was the reason to go to Catholic school. It was a normal Friday afternoon in Hartford, except there was anticipation building in the air with Christmas just around the corner. The city was decorated with lights, and G. Fox and Company had just put up its legendary portico display that drove visitors by the thousands to the, to the business and, ship and shopping district. The Cold War was raging with newly elected President Kennedy at the helm, but in the small gem of a city between Boston and New York, all was peaceful. On this day, Hartford Hospital, dead center of what was considered the city's golden triangle, Retreat Avenue, Jefferson, and Seymour Streets, was also considered by esteemed U.S. hospital designers architects and engineers as one of, if not the safest hospital in the country. And inside, it was just another busy, efficient day in a world that ran nonstop, 24 hours a day, seven days a week. Hartford Hospital simply never slept. At any one time, again, there were as many as 5,000 people in this building. I remember well that afternoon watching television on my parents' tiny black and white TV with the rabbit ears, you know, you got channel 3, 8, and 22. I was waiting for the start of the Ranger Andy show on channel 3 when suddenly 
the ominous words, bulletin, scrolled across the screen. Now, in those days, you recall that a television bulletin meant that something really bad was going down. With excitement in his voice, WTIC newscaster Dick Bertel, remember him? Came on the air to report, a major fire has broken out at Hartford Hospital. I didn't hear the rest. I ran outside of a small two-family flat. I lived in a Newberry, Newberry Street, not far from the hospital, and I looked up into the sky. What I saw sent a shiver through me that I will never forget, and ultimately was the memory that caused me to embark on the great adventure of writing this novel. Above me were great billowing clouds of black smoke so dense it darkened the afternoon, roiling through the clear afternoon sky and building in enormity with each passing second. I was both mesmerized and terrified. I had been in a patient in a hospital a year or two before with appendix or something, and I had a sort of a concept of what a hospital was. It certainly wasn't a place where, where, it was a place where sick people came to be healed and babies to be born. It was not a place where people burned to death. But all over Hartford, people held their breath for news that afternoon. Precious few details were known other than that at 2.39 p.m. on that unseasonably warm winter afternoon, the bell had come in for box 5141. The run card read medical card, medical center, excuse me. 85 Jefferson Street. This is a copy of the original run card, the pre-planned response for every building in the city. It shows you which engine and ladder companies were assigned to this particular firebox, depending upon how many alarms were issued. There's a story hidden here I'll talk more about in a moment. But within minutes, Harford Fire Department dispatchers Dick Walsh and Dan Kelly had three engine companies and two 100-foot aerial ladder trucks screaming towards Seymour Street. First responders found heavy smoke, more than 100 people trapped on the ninth floor, and no idea what the situation was in the rest of the building. Chief Thomas Lee called in a second alarm from his car even before arriving at the fire scene, instinctively knowing from the dense black smoke pouring out of the hospital, already visible for miles in every direction, that this was no ordinary situation. Within minutes of arriving at the scene, he called in the third alarm. Already, every off-duty firefighter in the department was rushing back to work either to join their brothers at the scene or report to standby locations. For nearly four hours that afternoon, Harford waited for news, as what was happening inside the building was nearly impossible to discern for even the hundreds of people who had flocked to watch along Washington Street. But one thing they couldn't help notice was the line of empty hearses and ambulances growing on Seymour Street and winding their way through the horseshoe driveway at the entrance. An entire city prayed when the newsmen who had struggled all afternoon to get access to the fire floor finally filed their reports that night, the outcome was grim. At a news conference that evening, reporters actually had the benefit of hearing eyewitness accounts from, of the disaster from patients and staff who had survived or been rescued. The pace of the investigation moved quickly through the night. In some cases, patients were still in their hospital gowns when interviewed by State Police Commissioner Leo J. Mulcahy and State Police Major Carol E. Shaw, who were conducting the official investigation of the fire. Shaw's statement to the press literally staggered Hartford as he made clear what had happened on the ninth floor. At 2.39, after smoldering for at least 30 minutes, a flash fire had raged through the post-op floor of the modern 13-story hospital, apparently ignited by a cigarette butt carelessly discarded into a trash chute. That theory was never absolutely proven, but given the pervasiveness of smoking in that day, in that time, it was certainly a rational conclusion. Arson was never completely ruled out, which is part of the premise of my story. But whatever the cause, in the heart-pounding minutes that followed, a huge fireball raced up the ductwork to the ninth floor where it finally found its escape. It was a latched trash chute door that shouldn't have failed. One of its two hinges was broken, a simple repair that was probably penciled in on a maintenance chart somewhere, but which hadn't yet been gotten to. With the force of a cannon, the fireball flew unchecked through the weakened trash chute door, ripping it off the wall and hurling it clear across the corridor and into a bathroom, a bathtub, a bathroom, excuse me, into a bathtub in a room on the other side of the floor. It was days before investigators found it. A blowtorch erupted from the chute. Its flames taking direct upward aim at acoustical ceiling tiles made of a sugar cane-based fiber glued to rock lathe pl plaster with a highly flammable adhesive. An unstoppable chain reaction began. The decorative tiles ignited immediately and flames rocketed along the ceiling in every direction like a wild wind-fed prairie grass fire sparked by a bolt of lightning. The upper four feet of wallpaper covering the hallway was set ablaze 
and flames instantly began spreading. The acoustical tiles burned through in seconds and set alight the adhesive, gluing them to the ceiling. Flaming tiles and globs of the adhesive rained down upon gleaming, freshly waxed and highly flammable linoleum floors that exploded into flames and raced to the wainscoting, also made of linoleum, that was applied along the bottom four feet of the wall. From floor to ceiling, the hallway was now a ring of fire that began to advance. Now the fire monster was unleashed and ravenous. With rocket-like velocity, it began devouring every centimeter of flammable material in the hallway, creating a virtual tunnel of fire. There was no stopping its progress unless the hallway fire doors were closed, a process that required a human being to swing the heavy, one-piece metal-clad door shut and latch. Hospital staff was only able to reach one door. As well, the only protection afforded patients, visitors, and staff in any room branching off the main or side corridors was a closed door. If a door was open, the enormous cloud of black smoke that rushed in as the fire advanced only preceded the flames. What followed was the horror of suffocation or being burned alive. A closed door meant possible protection from the flames, but closed or not, the black toxic smoke crept up through any crack, any seam or crevice and was deadly. In a matter of minutes, the fireball had virtually incinerated 275 feet of the unreachable ninth floor, leaving in its wake a charcoal tomb of terror, sadness, and death. Experts concluded afterwards that the temperature in the corridor exceeded 1,400 degrees. The 16 people who died did so quickly, some suffocating in their beds, <clears throat> even as they could hear the sounds of sirens screaming toward the hospital and men racing towards them in a desperate rescue attempt. Some died much more horrifically, chased down by the ravenous fire monster and overwhelmed before they could find shelter. The fire was indiscriminate in its killing, taking patients, nurses, staff, visitors, and even a young doctor about to finish his residency. Here a priest administers the last rites to a victim. When the smoke finally cleared, only a nightmare was left where the flames had been. A tragedy that would forever haunt the family of those 16 victims and traumatize even the most hardened veteran firefighters, police, doctors, and nurses. But the real story of the Hartford Hospital fire is what didn't happen. A story that got precious little attention from the media, which, as you know, was a very different animal in 1961, pre-Vietnam and Watergate. Unlike today, the media could be very superficial, more interested in rhetoric than facts, and often reported what it was told rather than what it found to be the facts. What didn't happen is that thousands more in the entire hospital weren't lost. This was a blast furnace that was intent on devouring the entire building and everyone in it. It took extraordinary acts of bravery by Hartford firefighters to prevent what could have been one of the worst disasters in US history. An interesting aside, there is a reason that only 70 men fought the Hartford Hospital fire. The truth is that's about the number of men who were available. A little remembered fact is that there was another major fire burning nearly simultaneously just a few blocks away at the corner of Zion and Ward Streets, an apartment building that had, that had the attention of nearly 40 more Hartford firefighters. There were precious few men left to guard the rest of the city of Hartford that day. If we go back and examine the run card for box 5141, I'm sure you'll get as confused as I did at first. I'm a little anal about this. Go on more, Jay. Because engines 8, 15, 11, and engines 8, 15, and 11, and ladder 2 never made it to the Hartford Hospital fire, although they're penciled in as first responders, or second alarm responders, I think. That's because those trucks and men were also first responders for the Zion Street fire, which had come in earlier. That meant that the apparatus that should have responded on a fourth alarm, which was not called, got pulled up the chain. And thank God it did. Engine 12, in particular, played a key role in this stop. More about that in a moment. But this shows just how well the department had planned for, for a major fire in the city, even that long ago, and in this case, for two major fires. It was the perfect storm. As you, imagine, my, as you might imagine, when I, when I write, I immerse myself in the story. I become part of the events and action playing in my mind. And I can remember experiencing a sort of epiphany when I finally understood the facts when I finally recognized what these guys were up against. It came to me when I began talking with the veterans who actually fought the fire. I have to tell you quickly that I had written 100 pages of this story, and I knew I was headed for trouble. 
I just knew instinctively I was headed for trouble. I was writing, my book was going to be aimed at firemen who were going to read the book, and they were going to look at it, and they were going to laugh because I had it all wrong. I just knew it instinctively. And when I sat down with the veterans of that fire, they were very quick to tell me that, yeah, good idea, rip up those 100 pages. <laughs> first, bad assumption. The first, the, the 70 men who responded to the three-alarm fire at Hartford Hospital found that their ladders were well short of the fire floor. They couldn't reach it. I had assumed, of course, that the ladders could reach. Sure, there were standpipes in the hallway of each floor, but the hoses were too light and the water pressure much too limited to be effective against such an intense fire. So the only way for firefighters to get to the fire was to climb 18 flights of stairs, carrying rolls of hose, donut rolls, they call them, weighing 100 pounds apiece. These are 150-pound young men wearing 50 pounds of turnout gear and carrying 100 pounds of hose over their shoulder. Second, they had almost no breathing apparatus available in smoke so thick that they couldn't see each other three feet away. And there might have been one Scott air pack, it wasn't even called Scott at that time, um, per truck. And that was usually safe for the newest member of each crew who refused to wear it because he didn't want to be called a wuss. And finally, they had no way to communicate. No walkie-talkies, no radios, only their voices and their trust in their fellow firefighters. The list of individual acts of heroism by members of the Harvard Fire Department that enabled them to make that remarkable stop on, on that day in December more than 53 years ago is long and mostly forgotten. But some are timeless in the annals of HFD lore. For example, let me tell you the story of Richie Tajerian. Danny mentioned him. A tillerman on Ladder 6 it was the second apparatus to arrive at the, at the fire. Ladder 6, commanded by Dan's father, Lieutenant Dan Nolan Sr., was fortuitously ordered to pull as close to pos as possible to the front portico of the hospital at the north end of the building by District Chief Jim Poveromo. The first chief on the scene had in mind to get men into the north wing of the fire floor through the last room on the floor where no smoke was showing and a lot of people were trapped. And trust me, the next couple of photographs that I'm going to show you hardly do justice to the act of heroism I'm about to describe. It was Richie Tajerian's job. Some people called him Dick. I never did quite figure out what he actually was called. But after expertly guiding the rear end of the huge ladder six into position, it was his job to run forward and raise the stick, short for raising the ladder into place. Unfortunately, the slightly built 25-year-old Tajerian found that after raising his ladder, to the approved 70 degree angle, to the approved 70 degree angle of inclination at an 80 foot extension, and only reached the seventh floor. It was two stories short. Increasing the inclination and extension would make the ladder dangerously unstable, no matter. All around him, the young Tajerian could see and hear the screams of people trapped in rooms where the doors had been closed when fire swept the corridor and who still clung to some hope of being saved. He had to do something. Now, who knows exactly what was going on in his mind at that moment? But after surveying the similar predicament of the other three ladder trucks that had responded, Tajerian took it upon himself to fully extend and raise the 100-foot ladder to a near vertical position. He climbed to the top and stood on the last rung of a ladder and used the slight indentations of the, brick, the building's brick mortar joints to steady himself. To his frustration, he was still three feet short of the window. Three feet. The difference in, between life and death for so many, perhaps the difference between whether he himself lived or died. What he did next shocked those watching the drama. Tajerian yelled instructions to nurses and patients waiting inside the ninth floor room for him and handed up his helmet and Halligan tool. And then without further hesitation, he sprung from that top rung, leaping the last three feet in an attempt to catch a thin metal window ledge with his fingertips. Miraculously, his fingers found a hold in that fragile ledge, but in a moment that seemed like eternity, he hung suspended in space by that sliver of metal on the window frame. For his brothers watching from below, it was as if the world suddenly stopped. Then they cheered as frantic hands reached down and pulled him inside. He made it. You would have thought that the young firefighter might have taken a moment to catch his breath or even to congratulate himself not to Jerry. It's possible that the often used words of Engine 12's Captain Timothy F. Kelleher, Sr., 
might have gone through his head at that moment. They say in football that the game is measured in yards, yet a good coach will tell you it's really all about inches. Kelleher used to share this with his new men. For a fireman, life is not about minutes. It's the seconds that count. Dejerian put those seconds to good use and immediately reached outside and pulled in firefighter George Gallion, his latter sixth brother, who leapt for the ninth floor window right behind him. I'm not sure the details of this. This, this, this has just come to me within the last week, in fact, this little detail. But I learned that Trigerian and Galleon's first order of business was to stop a panicked nurse from leaping out of the window to certain death. The two then hoisted other firefighters inside who began giving orders to nurses and patients to, wet, to stuff wet towels and sheets into any opening, any crevice that was allowing smoke into the room. Trigerian then braved the corridor so he could give the guys who were waiting in the stairwells the same men who had jogged up 18 flights of stairs carrying those 100-pound donor rolls, some idea of what was happening on the floor. Finally, they had eyes on the fire, and they hit it hard. This is the only photograph of firefighters actually battling the blaze that I've ever seen. Trigerian's act of bravery and the courage of George Gallion, Dan Nolan, and others who braved that ladder saved dozens of lives, perhaps hundreds, maybe more. Yet it was never reported by the media. Today, Wolf Blitzer would be airing tape of the miraculous leap every 30 seconds. Richie Tajerian would have been a guest on Good Morning America the next day, <laughs> Letterman that night, and he'd be a celebrated national hero. But even as Tajerian was making his will end the like leap, other Herculean efforts were ongoing all over the building. Engine 12's Kelleher, true to his own words, that every second counted, let a hose pull from the hospital portico and up the center section of the building to get water to the fire floor. Literally thousands of pounds of hose were hoisted up to the ninth floor by crews from engine 12 and engine one. A massive undertaking that got water into the center of the building before flames could burn through the north wing fire door. With water now available in the center lobby of the floor, fire crews attacked the fire beasts from the south, center, and north wings. And finally, the monster breathed no more. But the job was far from done for the exhausted firefighters. Kelleher was then put in command of rescuing passengers trapped in two elevators battling intense heat and smoke to free them. And even as firefighters were knocking down the last of the flames, every available man, including those who were reporting for, for duty on an off-duty day, were assisting in the mass evacuation of every patient from the 13th to the 8th floor. This photograph of Lieutenant John Larkin, uh, his son Peter is in the room here tonight. He's been a boy, boyhood friend of mine. <laughs> This photograph of Lieutenant John Larkin of Engine 6 helping to evacuate a patient made the front page of newspapers all across the country. The hallway and narrow stairways slick with water runoff from the ninth floor battle made the evacuation that much more dangerous, and they were packed with firefighters, police, nurses, and doctors lending in the effort to avoid more casualties. In the lobby, hospital staff worked furiously to release patients who were well enough to continue their recovery at home in order to make room for those who needed continued care in the hospital. Now, it might seem that Out of Reach is just another fire novel, but it's more than that. Just as the disaster was more than a fire, than just a fire. It's also a story about people who risked and sometimes lost their lives to save others, people who fought to live, of couples who embraced each other in their final minutes of life. But most of all, it's about the Harford Fire Department in perhaps the finest hour of its long history, in the face of impossible odds. It's about men who never asked for or received any special attention or thanks. They were just doing their jobs, but ultimately it was all about the way they demonstrated the true meaning of brotherhood, the bond that would ultimately ensure their success against an overwhelming enemy. Out of Reach is the product of some 10 months of interviews with firefighters who actually fought the monster and lived to talk about it. It's interesting to note that fully 90% of the men who fought the Hartford Hospital fire were veterans of the Second World War or Korea. They came home to Hartford seeking peace, having witnessed horrors that most of us can't imagine. They came home with a lot of bad memories, and there wasn't a lot of talking about their experiences. But when it came time to restart their lives, the Hartford Fire Department was a natural fit. Yes, it was a dangerous job, but a cakewalk, considering all they'd been through. What it did offer was a steady paycheck, the chance to raise a family in peace, the military regimentation they had become accustomed to right 
down to the uniform and discipline for guys who were not only quick-witted, but now also quick-fisted and walked with the assurance that nothing could stop them. You have to remember, these were men who fought noth thought nothing of walking into a burning building with a lit cigarette in one hand and a halogen iron in the other. Their military-like discipline and we've got a job to do attitude was infectious for the younger men. So you had a department of let's get her done guys who didn't question authority, who knew their jobs and went about them with precision. Men like 35 year firefighter, Frank Droney. Where are you, Where are you Frank? <laughs> Perhaps one of the finest truck men to ever wear a Hartford Fire Department uniform. There wasn't a veteran I talked to who didn't pick Frank Droney as the guy they'd most like to have at their back in any situation. He and George Gallion, I might add, spent a year in the thick of the Allied push in Korea, baking in summer and freezing in winter in search of the victory of capturing one more of those hills. They saw a lot of blood run down them. Where's George? George Gallion. George. <laughs> And men like Lieutenant Bob King, still a South End, still a South End firehouse legend who went from living at battle stations manning his gun in the South Pacific in support of the Iwo Jima and Okinawa campaigns to giving his best to those who needed help the most as a Hartford fireman for 25 years. Bob has been my friend for many, many years and earned my respect when I was nothing more than a juvenile delinquent who heartily deserved his time but time is something he's always had for me and for so many others. Lieutenant John Larkin was in the first wave to hit Anzio Beach during the early dark days of the war in Europe and fought through the bloody stalemate in Monte Cassino. Lieutenant Fred Bartlett, his son Bill, is here in the audience with me tonight, another lifelong friend. He was a medic who somehow made it ashore at Omaha Beach doing what Lily could for kids who were slaughtered before taking their first steps on European soil. Firefighter Ed Skeen, Jr., he's with us tonight. Ed, I know you're 97 years old, but you look like you could still climb a ladder. Ed Skeen, Jr. somehow fought his way through the savage fighting at the Battle of the Bulge to come home to a career in the Hartford Fire Department. He was a driver on truck three the day of the fire, but was off duty when the alarm came in. No matter, he reported to his company and was instrumental in the evacuation of patients on the ninth floor that day. There's pictures of him in the Hartford Hospital display, in fact. And uh, his son, Gary, right, and Brian are with him tonight. They were all heroes. Vinny DiCiaccio of Engine 10. He was in Marines. Frankie Zazari of Engine 6, he cruised the North Atlantic for three and a half years. Firefighters Nick Tosca, Vernon Tyson, Lieutenant and later Captain Dan Nolan Sr., who busted through the North Wing with his Truck 6 crew. Captain Timothy Kelleher Sr., who distinguished himself with his heroism and leadership at the Hartford Hospital Fire, while his 14-year-old son, Tim Kelleher Jr., watched in awe. It was men like these who dug in and fought and refused to go down when it appeared they had no hope of turning back the beast. But the Hartford Hospital fire monster didn't anticipate such a brawl. It underestimated the courage and spunk of simple men who knew they had a job to do <clears throat> before they could go home to be husbands and fathers. Men like Richie Tajarian, who certainly understood what it took to be at his best when someone needed him. Richie, some called him Dick, as I said, never got the credit he deserved for his bravery that day. But I think we have an opportunity to make up for that right now. It's my pleasure to introduce to you as children, Rick, Diane, and Linda, and his nephew, Sean, who are with us. Now you know why on the night of December 8th, 1961, when all the smoke had cleared, there still was a Hartford Hospital. 
Out of Reach owes many thanks to many people, but two men in particular who are here tonight. The first is Captain Retired Timothy Kelleher, Jr. Tim, wave. A former Hartford Firefighter of the Year, who was the 14-year-old boy who watched his father in action that fateful day, went on to his own distinguished 25-year career in the Hartford Fire Department, giving his all just like his dad. Tim Jr. was my lifeline through this book, sharing hundreds of hours of his memories, insights, amazing knowledge of the science of fighting fires, and countless anecdotes with me to help shape out of reach. Without him, there wouldn't have been a book, I can tell you. I would have ripped up the 100 pages and given up. Or an opportunity to salute the heroes of December 8, 1961. Tim Jr. guided me patiently through the sorting out of the intricacies of a very dark and complicated moment in Hartford's history and saved me from my own ignorance. For a while, at least, he made me a fireman. Most importantly, perhaps the greatest satisfaction I received from writing this novel is earning Tim's friendship. Timmy, I love you like a brother, and thank you for helping me think like a firefighter so I could get the words right for men who deserve nothing less. <laughs> I also have to thank Harford Fire Marshal and Rocky Hill Volunteer Fire Chief Mike Garrahy for his incredibly generous help in literally walking me through the fire scene and allowing me to see and touch a piece of history. He was also a lifeline in the writing of Out of Reach, helping me to understand how the hospital worked way back when. Mike has provided superb leadership in guiding Hartford Hospital in its efforts not to bury this difficult piece of its history, but to use it as a constant reminder of what can happen. If you haven't seen the museum quality display of the fire at the hospital, for which Mike is greatly responsible, I urge you to take the time to do so. You know, Mike comes from a family of heroes too. His dad, Rocky Hill Volunteer Fire Department Tom Captain Thomas Gary, he died in the line of duty in 1981. I want to close by offering an observation by a writer who has been studying men in situations of extreme duress for some time now. I've come to the personal conclusion that man is the ultimate dichotomy. On one hand, all I have to do is read the paper, watch CNN. He's the, he is evil incarnate, capable of the most incredibly sick, cowardly, and violent crimes against other human beings. On the other, he can be all that defines goodness, capable of the most amazing acts of courage and bravery often willing to put his own life in harm's way to save in others, even if they're strangers. Richie Tajerian, George Gallian, Dan Nolan Sr. and Jr., Bob King, Frank Droney, Tim Keller Sr. and Jr., John Larkin, Fred Bartlett, Frank Cesaro, Nick Tosca, Vernon Tyson, Vinny DiCiaccio, and of course, Mike Garrahy are just a few examples. Out of reach embodies both characters, but also gives rise to another testament to the goodness of man, one that I believe ought to be engraved on the badge of every firefighter. Abraham Lincoln said it. Next to creating life, the finest thing a man can do is save one. That's what firefighters do every day for little or no credit. And now you know why I said earlier that telling the story is one of the greatest honors and also one of the most humbling experiences of my life. Thank you for listening. Time for a few questions. Thanks, Mark. I know we, we have a, f a few minutes. We want Mark to have a chance to, to sit down and talk to people, and maybe even maybe somebody wants to buy his book. Um, uh, but you know, on behalf of uh, you know this, the, the Hartford Public Library, we'd like to thank you for coming this evening um, and, and, and for capturing some of the, the history uh, of this city. So, and I would like to th again thank you all for coming. If, if anybody has a, a question for Mark, we could we could probably take a few brief questions. I know a lot of people might want to tell stories about that day, and I, and I want to honor that as well. Um, but we, we do want to give Mark a little bit of time to, to sit. And uh, So if anybody has any questions for Mark, I'm happy to, uh, to provide a, a microphone. Uh, if not, we can, uh, we can send you in the back, and you can uh, say hello to some folks and that sort of thing. So. I can hug my sons. And you can hug your sons. So. Again, so let's thank, uh, let's thank Mark uh, for a wonderful presentation.